This is First You Hustle, a podcast from the Columbus College of Art and Design meant to help students and creative professionals put their expertise to use. And this is an episode in our three-part art preservation series. Wait, this doesn't sound like art preservation series music. Let's change that. Ah, much better. Join us now for the final installment of our three-part series featuring professionals in the field of art preservation from a recent live panel discussion on campus. With a panel event stretching over 90 minutes, we've divided up the presentation to feature each panelist's responses individually. For this episode, we feature two guests, Chloe Singer, the archivist at Columbus College of Art and Design. She has a background in collection management in paper and book preservation. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Photography from The Ohio State University and a Master's of Library and Information Sciences with a focus in archives, preservation, and records management from the University of Pittsburgh. Singer is an active member of the Society of American Archivists, SAA, and our second guest is John D'Elia, who is a real estate developer, entrepreneur, and author who actively owns and manages a portfolio that houses families from four continents and is valued in excess of $2.5 million. Make sure you listen to our other two episodes to hear from Sarah Marsum's work in preservation consultant and Lindsay Jones in preservation through construction and repair. Now let's join Namisha Bott, our host in the prestigious Kinzani Auditorium on the campus of Columbus College of Art and Design. All right, I think we're gonna go ahead and start. Thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, We are here to talk to you about careers in preservation, specifically as art grads, and what that can mean for you making connections from your art background into preservation as a career. So my name is Namisha. I'm actually cataloging an instruction librarian here at CCAD, so if you've seen my friendly face in the library, that is why. I'm going to have the panelists all introduce themselves and maybe give like one or two sentences describing what you do. I'm Chloe, and um, I'm the archivist here at CCAD, so I work down in the library with Namisha. So how many of you have actually heard of preservation, or like the word preservation, or know what it is? Cool, because it can be really convoluted, right? So the definition that I pulled, historic preservation is a conversation with our past about our future. It provides us with opportunities to ask what is important in our history, and what parts of our past can we preserve for the future? And really, preservation can be the physical act of saving things or creating programs, creating content, um, ways to connect with the community in order to keep ideas alive. And really, while we're talking with our panelists here, we're going to highlight the ways that they specifically, through their jobs and their passions, are keeping ideas alive through preservation and the arts. So for our first question, what was your educational or occupational journey like, and how did you get to where you are now? Chloe, tell us about yourself. So um, I started, well, growing up, I was always interested in art and always knew that I wanted to do something with art, but um, both my parents were librarians and (laughs) academics, and um, so I knew that I was going to college, like that was the route, and surprisingly, my parents were both very supportive in the arts and wanted me to, you know, pursue this dream of being an artist, so um, I went to Ohio State and was in fine arts photography was my major. and during my junior year at the time, it was a requirement to take a class called Second Experience, which was basically an internship for class credit. And I found um, my internship at uh, the Costume and Textile Museum, which was in-house at Ohio State. Um, it's kind of a hidden gem. It's not open to the public, and not a lot of people know about it, but it is quite an extensive collection. So um, I started there, and I was basically hired on to take photographs of the clothing there, um, detail images of the construction, um, anything that was unique about each item, um, and so they could upload that into their catalog um, as well as preserve if these items were lost or damaged in any way. So I started doing that and got really interested in how there was still these clothing and textiles from the late 1700s, and we still had these. I mean, my we were talking about this before um, we began that my clothes aren't going to last 20 years. Like, they don't make things like this anymore, and you can't, and they were, you know, originals. Um, it was a great way. I saw many professors take request items and take them into the classroom, and I sat in on classes, how they would teach using these items, you know, t- teach fashion design classes, um, showing 
these examples of clothing from the late 1700s and early 1800s and over the years um, how they've changed and evolved and how cool. Like I very quickly realized how important it was to preserve the past and um, how important it was to have these examples of what was done and how things have changed and now how we need to go back to doing that or um, you know how we can um, yeah make it full circle into that. So. Um, I started, after my class was over, I continued to work there um, and ran their small exhibition um, gallery space. And the curator there really kind of took me under her wing and showed me how and why um, the process of collecting the materials, um, evaluating them, preserving them, um, and like how long they can be on exhibit and why and all those you know things that go on behind the scenes um so i talked to her about how she got to where she is because it really interested me even more than fine art photography did <laughs> um and surprisingly because i had been on this path since i was young and now i was finding something that was completely different and something i would could see myself doing long term um so i she said yeah well i went to library school and i thought library school, that's weird, both my parents went to library school and I never saw myself going to library school. How does this <laughs> connect? And um, yes, both my parents were librarians, but they were a very different type of librarian than in archives and preservation was. So I um, went to the University of Pittsburgh um, and got my master's in library science with a concentration in archives and preservation. And while I was there, I worked in the in-house preservation lab and learned more about um, other diff different types of preservation of books and paper documents and records and artifacts um, and their special collections. So that was a different avenue of preservation from what I had learned at the Textile Museum. Um, and yeah, from there, I, I stayed in Pittsburgh after graduation. I got hired um, at a very small audiovisual digitization company where they digitize legacy audio, um, film, and video from institutions like CCAD and, um, yeah, museums, uh, yeah, <laughs> and um, I, that was interesting, I definitely learned a lot, I was a, a preservation specialist, so I would come up with a lot of these institutions didn't know they had the material, they had tons of these films, but didn't know what to do with them. And so my job was to kind of help them figure out how much storage space they would need, um, what to say to their IT department on how they were going to preserve once they got the digitized material back. Because once you digitize it, yes, that's a way of preserving it, but then you have two items to preserve, the digital copy and the physical copy. Um, so it was interesting to kind of create these plans for them um, when they didn't really know what they're doing. But I also realized that I didn't, I would rather have worked with my own collection per se, or at an institution that had their own collection, um, and be able to work with that collection from the beginning to end and see it through the stages um, and continue to grow it um, instead of just working with a different institution every couple months um, on their projects and kind of not seeing where it went after it left our facility. Um, so yeah, so when the job came open at CCAD for the archivist position, I thought it was a great opportunity to move back to Columbus as well as um, yeah, be an archivist, which is what I wanted to do when I started graduate school. So yeah, it has been, it's been a great opportunity to work here. Was there a particular medium you knew you wanted to work with? Was because you had a photography background, did you know you wanted to work with photographs, you were born digital, or? Um, yeah, so, my big uh, draw from being a fine arts photographer, <laughs> photographer was uh, because once I got later on in my um, college career, I was kind of being pushed more towards digital photography, and I was not, not that I wasn't comfortable with it, it wasn't my passion, it's not what I went to art school to do. I was way more interested in film and alternate processes and things like that. So um, when I started in preservation and archives, I, I definitely wanted I had more interest in the physical preservation of things than um, the digital or digitally born records. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I guess I do have a more fond view of photo, photographs and film than I do other artifacts, but phys physically touching and physically being able to preserve that object is what um, 
really drew me to it over digital image. We've got some examples of some work that you've done behind yeah, us. Yeah, so this was a scrapbook that I found <laughs> buried in our archive downstairs. Yeah, um, and, and you, you'll you never, well, you'll see this soon, but um, yeah. our archives, we never really had an archivist or an archives per se here at CCAD. We had a room just full of stuff. And yeah, so we had the materials. We just didn't have anyone that was Trained, per, to, trained to preserve it or digitize it and tell or Chloe show it. Yes. So it's a, been a long project. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I've been, in the past two years, I've been trying to work towards the physical arrangement and um, rehousing of things that needed immediate attention. Um, and then hopefully going forward, we're going to have things digitized and up and running so you can look through them digitally and not just physically. Ooh, as an um, example. <laughs> yes, so yeah, so this is where we started. Uh, On the left the is a picture of a very messy room with things in it. Yeah, like we essentially couldn't walk into it when I started and now things are are getting there slowly but surely. I mean, there's always, as everyone knows, the archives always will have a backlog, but that's okay because uh, if there's nothing to preserve, then where's my job? <laughs> um, but yeah, so things are a lot are getting there. They're getting a lot more um, organized. And now if I get requests from different departments or from students and projects going on, I can quickly find them. Whereas before, it would take a lot longer to find anything. And then we've got examples from your work that you did organizing the anniversary show. Yeah. So yeah, that's another thing that I've been able to do. Um, that's kind of and merge both my backgrounds in art as well as uh, preservation and archives where um, I work to curate this exhibit, um, the 140th anniversary of our school. And um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. We've got some year old yearbooks and ephemera and photographs. Yeah, and also during Chroma, we're gonna have kind of a um, another show that is gonna include the majority of these in it, so. So if you came from an arts background, have you melded that, we've kind of talked about this already, but have you melded that with your current profession or career path? Yeah, I think I already like touched on that and the fact that um, I was way more interested and in tuned with the physical aspects of preservation because of my background in arts, um, in fine arts particularly, and um, my need or want to um, work with film photography instead of digital. And I think that really drew me towards um, preservation and archives and the saving of the physical object. Um, don't get me wrong, there's tons and tons and probably even more jobs in digital born archiving and preservation. And But for me, that was like my um, draw to it. Um, yeah, so I don't think I would have got, I definitely wouldn't have gotten into it without an arts background. And I think that I use it. Um, it definitely helps me being a creative person, helps me with um, creatively finding out, figuring out treatments and putting, things together because yes there is a wrong and a right way to do things in preservation but you're never going to come across the same problem twice um, there's always going to be something different about each project and I think that um, coming from a creative background and um, I don't know about learning to think creatively but being pushed to think creatively and go deeper and and find out ways of problem solving in this in a creative way um, has really helped me be a better archivist and preserve do you have to, or will you have to, eventually in your capacity as an archivist, have to preserve student work from CCAD? Not here. That's more um, for the gallery, actually. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so the records we have in CCAD's arch archive is more, in we're institutional archives, so we do more of documents, um, yeah, documents of the campus, um, of students, but not student work. Mm -hmm. So we have images of campus, we have film of campus, of um, images of classroom lectures <laughs> and things like that, um, records of the buildings being built, um, financial records, things like that, not really student work at this time. So what are the unique ways that CCAD students can lend their talents to your line of work? Yeah, I, I think I remember um, growing up or like in deciding what I was going to do as a career and everyone telling me that, not everyone, but people around me telling me that it was too specific, that I was never going to find a job because it's too specific and it's too much of a, a niche. And um, I think that CCA students and 
art students in general can really use that use that to your advantage. You know, um, it might be specific, but that doesn't mean it's bad or that you're not going to be able to do it. That you have to choose something else. Um, I might not be doing what exactly I started out to do, but I found it, and I think it's even better suited for me. So yeah, to use that to your advantage. Use your creativity and what you've learned and the different directions you've gone in, and it's pushed you in um, to your advantage. Is there anything, if you haven't already said it, that you would like CCAD students to know leaving this or after listening to this that they should know when navigating a career in preservation if they today were like, I am now going to pursue preservation? Or you can always stop downstairs in the museum <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and see the archive right here. I don't know so. if you hang out at the CCAD library yeah. and archives, but it's here in the building. How yeah. do I get an archive tour if I'm interested? Yes, please. Um, yeah, so email me or the library, um, archives, under, um, archives underscore CCAD, no, yeah, <laughs> at ccad.edu or just mine's easier. I never, well, I have it. I have access to it, but no one ever uses it. So, um, yeah, ccad.edu at ccad .edu, or honestly, stop by when the library is open and I would love to show you anything you're interested in. <laughs> we don't get enough. I, I mean, I remember being a student, an art student, and getting so much inspiration from looking at archives, exhibits, and just going into different archives. So, yeah, I would love to show you. It's also around. so great to navigate around campus and then go to the archives and see pictures of people interacting with the space. And you're just like, oh, their clothes are so funny. Yeah, yeah. I've had a lot of students, our student workers um, in the library be like, do you have any pictures of what was there before the apartments, before Shot and Scene was there, before this building was there? And I'm like, yeah, I can show you all about it. And they're like, oh my God, it looks so weird. And, it all used to be row houses and you know different types of buildings. So and one of yeah. your buildings was an old car dealership, and that's yeah, super cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really cool. I mean, yeah. Uh, we're doing a you're doing a Packard building tour. Yes, this summer. Hypothetically, summer. I'm not the one in charge of it. So right. it's with Landmarks. Yes. 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 Columbus, Landmarks. Columbus Landmarks. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So, um, but yeah, we also have. You, our, how do I stay in the loop with? Archive and library events. Yes, so we, um, CCD Packard Library um, has uh, Instagram, um, the, um, the archive has a Facebook as well as the Packard Library Facebook page and um, events and everything will posted on there as well as like the CCD um, social, social media, media accounts and everything like that. Yeah, we do have events. I mean, we've had like a historic buildings tour around campus, which was fun. Um, as well as the exhibition that's going to be up again during Chroma in the library, so stop on by. It's an, the alumni headquarters, but um, all of that material and archive material is going to be up anyway, so it'd be cool for you to stop by. You've just heard from Chloe Singer, who manages the archives at Columbus College of Art and Design. The second half of this episode will feature the same questions, but responses from a different individual, John D'Elia, who works in real estate, but found work in preservation through that venture. Here's John's responses from the panel. I am John Delia. I am the CEO of Housing Joint Venture. I'm a real estate developer and a person who's normalizing finance with visuals and design. So for our first question, what was your educational or occupational journey like and how did you get to where you are now? John. Howdy. Up next, tell <coughs> us about your journey. My journey, I love Sarah's journey. That was so informative. It's a good journey. And like, yeah, enjoyable. Thank mm -hmm. you for sharing. Uh, my journey. My journey is um, traditional and non-traditional. Um, you know, I went to college. I, I was, my father was a real estate developer in New York, so I grew up on job sites and playing with Legos and not knowing really what I was doing, but, you know, getting to hang out on, you know, construction stuff happening and dirt moving and me really just wanting food and to go home, really, but, you know, forced to stay in the office. <laughs> Um, so that really led me to my curiosity with education. Uh, growing up, I grew up privileged, but I always also recognized disparities in the world. And really, I was like, oh, well, you know, how do these things work and who controls all of this? And I was like, oh, if, if you're in business or a landlord, you can like fix a neighborhood because you could control who goes here and who goes there and, you know, all that kind of built environment. So, you know, it led me to. I guess college where first I was non-traditional so I jumped in and I got a real estate license went to community college got a real estate license was not going to a four-year institution that was not the plan 
Um, but I realized I didn't want to just do business or real estate, so then I started studying business and then real estate. Those were really boring because I've always got to be creative and open and free, and it was like, oh, suits is the easiest <laughs> way to describe them. Nothing wrong with that. We need business. Um, but I got bored, so eventually, you know, curiosity, I ended up at Knowlton School of Architecture in Ohio State, and I was really interested in larger like cities and planning cities instead of just single sites or single financial models. I spent a lot of time in libraries because I wanted to be an architect secretly. It was like, I want to build and design buildings because, you know, creation and construction are very similar. I think it's one thing to be able to construct a building, but in terms of like facades and connections and, you know, the storytelling of spaces and programming, I think it's very dynamic. Um, so I spent a lot of time reading source books and in libraries, just studying buildings, name, date, designer, et cetera. Um, but that really led me to the kind of the, the, the neighborhoods where I could afford. So I was at Ohio State, and I remember I was in the Business Builders Club, and I had a business plan, but it wasn't tech. And I really couldn't, um, I wanted to invest in real estate, but I couldn't really afford off-campus housing. It was like, I don't have any money. But I came from New York, so money was like more valuable to me here than it was there. Because there, you can't buy anything. But here, you're like, oh my god. <laughs> so, you know, I got into real estate while I was in school, took some time off of school to be in neighborhoods and in communities. It's funny, you have a visual up here. So, you know, I've, I've got to work with actually CCAD people and students, but I've always been a community. And when I say um, real estate housing, at one time it just started off with like feeling privileged. So here I am, this like black kid going into black urban neighborhoods and I'm buying up these buildings. And it was like, you know, the biggest meccas in these environments were literally the corner stores. And you're like, oh my God, these people are going in drones to the corner store. And it's like, you know, just trash and negative graffiti. And I was like, okay, well, we're buying stuff and we're doing stuff. What if we can control what people see? And how do you control? Because I'm a control freak, FYI. So how do you control? You're like, okay, we'll take their Mecca, which Jaquetta's was like the largest corner store in this community. And we're like, instead of saying just free my bro, that was a real, you know, I'm in jail. My brother's in jail. Free my bro. But, you know, instead of just like, you know, negative symbolism, like all these kids are going to get sweets and you know candy and all this stuff i'm like they're seeing all this negativity so really how can you use just design and visual stuff or creativeness you know to um to just change and impact people positively who don't often control their circumstance their neighborhood or the development going around around them um so you know so today you know i, I develop houses but and you know real estate and stuff like that but really it's it still goes back to like creativeness and design and visual design and just you know finance and investing. Really boring. I know none of my friends want to talk about money, but if I show you a money comic book about this superhero who gets really rich developing neighborhoods, you know you might like it. No, but you know so it's just how can you make it less intimidating to discuss you know serious topics? And I find that creativity, design, and you know creativeness is a solution. Actually, that's a great idea because I know nothing about like budgeting and investing and all that stuff. But if there was a graphic novel about you know? it, I might learn something. Yeah. Um, we have some other visuals of work you've done. So more with um, so I will, I've worked with a lot of CCAD alumni, professors, and still students. And really, so another thing is it's like in buildings, buildings. So I go into these neighborhoods that are like blighted and they're dirty. And it's like no one can, like here's a building, oh, it was, it's different, but it's the same. So basically, you know, it starts as hand sketching, then it goes to digital painting, and you know, really I, I try to find the best talent who, whether it's illustration, digital painters, animators, graphic designers, it doesn't really matter. It's like translating the real reality into almost fiction. So it's like you get to control fiction through design. So, you know, whether you're designing a video game or a street, it's like, once again, how can I make, you know, finance, real estate, all these, you know, concepts less intimidating. And really, I think it's through the creative arts. Um, you know, once again, it's like here's on the bottom, what it left, I guess, my left shoulder. You know, this this was literally, it was like, okay, you know, I speak a lot. One side, people, my vision really like, bad. What? And if you look on this other side, here are my goggles, here are the John goggles. You might be able to see this future. And really, it's a theme, I guess, across the country when you hear things like gentrification and, you know, you're being priced out of certain communities and things like that. I mean, you know, I, I could see it happening in many cities, and especially in Columbus 10 years ago when I was investing. Oh, there's the other one. So it's like, you know, a photographer, CCAD guy. You know, he went to a site, literally used photography, took photos. We decided which parts of the images we were going to isolate, what we were going to do to kind of clean it up and make it idealistic. And, you know, it transformed into that. So, you know, a lot of what I do is, once again, it's just humanizing these 
these serious and important topics, but I think we neglect them because it's like we feel they're, they're either not for us or we shouldn't participate or we feel they're wrong. It's like having money is wrong, but it doesn't have to be wrong. So yeah, some design. Oh, and then you know more projects. So selling projects and concepts, um, I don't know, it's like storytelling. You get to tell a story. So developing a real estate, a building, a hall, a town, a city, it's like you get to tell a story of you know, what you want that place to be, but you know, I, I think in marketing, you have to understand who, I'm, who am I telling this story to, who's gonna listen, and what audience is actually gonna participate in those places. So you know, once again, another CCAD greatness. But you know, just in a development, if we're gonna build something, what's the design, what's the look, what's the feel, what's the mood? And you, know, you take conceptual visuals and we turn them into investment capital because people, um, people like a good story and they wanna be a part of the journey, not just, you know, I guess the people we deal with, not just like the financial numbers on paper. How do the arts play a part in your career presently or possibly for your future occupational goals? Sarah and John, I was kind of thinking of you with this question. And in, in my own profession, um, I guess I, I have it good. I have the, you know, I'm like an art director, I guess. But, um, you know, I, art is, it's, you know, we're immersed in art and in the creative business. Uh, once again, in order to sell projects, we have to attract, our demographic is typically the creative class or, you know, the upper middle class who loves creativity or at least the image of it. <laughs> Maybe not necessarily, you know, the firsthand experiences. But, you know, I find that in, in a lot of the transitional environments we invest in, if it's not the artists moving into these spaces first to make it cool to create and to do these tactile, you know, um, creations, it's, you know, it's just place, ma place making. I mean, you know, whether it's a building, a development, if whether it's you're commissioning like an artist to literally sculpt metal, you know, sculptures for the yard or the, you know, the grounds of a property or, you know, when I think about hospitality and buildings and what do I put on my walls? Because, you know, for, for us, for me, development is an experience. So it's, you know, it's, I don't often get to go to museums anymore as much as I'd love to, but it's, you know, buildings are, you know, public space, can be public and private space, but, you know, common spaces, hallways, building, you know, wall space, it's like, how can I, you know, make this feel, you know, and I think for us, it's all about the feeling, the humanism, once again. So, you know, I, I get to hire the artists. I think, you know, as, as much as I get to, you know, do the development, I'm very hands-on on, you know, selection of talent, the rigor, I think it's, you know, the people who really love their craft, we get to hire them, work with them, and transform this creativity into, you know, monetary gain through business. But. Yeah, and it seems like you're always really thinking in an artistic or creative lens whenever you're communicating your vision to someone, so it's really interesting your, the way that you're infusing art into your job. I would say we're, we're pioneering, but we're also non-traditional in the sense that you know, it's like the emerging markets, you know, artists are willing to take a risk and try something new. So I think that, you know, we're, we're a very old world primitive business, but I think, it, and it's very serious. It's, a, you know, once again, it's like business and money, but everyone wants to go to the gallery opening or everyone wants to go to the creative space. And, you know, for us, I think it's in, it's immersed in our, in our fabric. So it's whether it's the presentation material or there, whether it's a, you know, public event and you have to think about the curation of the space and, you know, the layouts and the, the print materials and, you know, just that whole user experience is very important. So, you know, it's art is like a critical aspect of our, our business. I think for us, we leverage it as an advantage. Very cool. So what are the unique ways that CCAD students can lend their talents to your line of work? Be super passionate about your craft and about your individual discipline. You know, once again, I think that you'll find non-traditional spaces want to seek you out or use your creative talents. But you know, I can't put the creativity bug in you, and I can't, you know, you know, you apprenticed, I apprenticed, all of us have kind of had to spend that time honing in our craft and really, you know, dedicating ourselves to the details and the studies and that, you know, that fineness. But I think, you know, your work can be translated into the, the market or the business world. You know, and for us, I never thought I would be doing murals and gardens and, you know, art displays and like creative mood boards and such. But, you know, really where our, our market is moving is, is you look at like bank commercials who are using animation. You know, like Huntington Bank is now normal because they're cool. So I think look at, you know, the, de <laughs> the demographic shifts. And really it's like, you know, you know, you could use your tools to create for yourself and others. What advice do you wish you had gotten as an adolescent or college student before embarking on your career? Teamwork. 
uh, and collaboration. I remember at Ohio State, um, in planning, because you're doing city plans, it's John can't be just the master developer with a brush stroke and say, hey, we're gonna build this. It's really a collaborative effort, and I, you know, it's the bane of your existence. Someone's gonna let you down. Sorry, it happens. <laughs> but um, you know, I, I recognize now our team is spread off San Francisco, New York, Dallas, here. Um, you're not always going to be doing local work and or working with local team members. So just you know, being able to manage remote work, working on a team, clear communication, I think you know, it kind of reaffirms some of those business skills. But just you know, look at the major sports teams. I don't watch sports, but I know that you know, Super Bowls and Olympics happen on teams sometimes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so teamwork. <laughs> and there's different like positions that you have to learn to navigate on the team. So sometimes, you know, I want to be the leader, and other times I have to be a supporting cast member. Um, but the more experience you can get collaborating and communicating remotely, I think, you know, in the, the new economy, it's, it's going to be very valuable. So I hope that was helpful for you. And if you have any other questions, feel free to find us after the panel. We have our emails up there if you want to contest, contact us that way. Chloe and I are here all the time. So if you see <laughs> our friendly faces around, don't feel shy. You can just talk to us there. So thank you so much. Thank you for listening and make sure you tune in to our other episodes on this series to hear from other areas of art preservation. It is a wide career field, so learn from the variety of experiences our panelists have had by tuning into the full series. Take care. <laughs>